My job this morning is to talk about how we got here. We are not in a good place when it comes to Lyme disease. This is an infectious disease caused by a bacterium, but it's not your average bacterium and it's not your average disease. So my job is to tell you kind of how we got to this point, and I thought the best way to start that would be to talk about where we are right now. And because this is 2017, I couldn't help myself, so I'm gonna start with the mainstream facts. What are the facts of Lyme disease as we know them right now? So fact number one is that Lyme disease is a disease that's hard to catch and easy to cure. That's fact number one. It's, caused, it's transmitted by ticks, so therefore it's hard to catch. We have accurate diagnostic tests. In fact, the CDC recommends those tests um, that are uh, for diagnosis of Lyme disease, and they are very good tests. They're very accurate, very strong. There are dozens of scientific studies that show no reproducible or convincing evidence that any symptoms that continue after um, antibiotics are finished or even any long-term symptoms, symptoms like what Jessica has, what Pat's daughter had, are there's no relationship between bacterial infection and what's going on in those kinds of patients. And we've done all the clinical tests of antibiotics, and what we know is that long-term antibiotics do nothing to improve the quality of life of patients who have these long-term symptoms. So those are the facts, according to um, you know, mainstream thinking. And so again, because this is 2017, I'm going to present to you the alternative facts. And the alternative facts are that Lyme disease is the second most common infectious disease out of all types of infectious diseases in the United States. Number one is chlamydia, number three is gonorrhea, Lyme disease is number two. So I don't really think it's all that hard to catch. The recommended serological assays are falsely negative half the time. There are hundreds of peer review studies that show a relationship between bacterial infection and chronic disease. Not just with Lyme disease, but many other types of bacteria as well. Hundreds of them. And of the clinical trials that were done to provide the scientific evidence that long-term antibiotics do not provide benefit for patients, not one of them actually shows that. So those are the alternative facts. And when you put that all together, this is kind of what that relationship looks like. So I, this is my view of what Lyme disease is at this current state, where me and others like me are over there saying, you know, people are really sick and the science doesn't add up and there's problems, to which we get this response. So I gotta tell you, in science, to use words like anti-science and activist and pseudoscientific and subverter of evidence-based research, and peer-reviewed science and your threat to public health, that's the equivalent in science of calling somebody a stupid, fat, ugly bitch terrorist and shut up and sit down. <laughs> now you might be wondering why did I choose those specific words? And the answer is because they were published in 2011 in a paper by the Lions basically calling all, active, all, all advocates, all physicians, all um, anybody who disagreed with their particular perspective, terrorists. So I often think that it's helpful to understand the present to go back and look at the past. And as Tammy mentioned, I have read all those papers from the past, starting with the very first ones, where the first one you see on the left is actually the first publication on Lyme disease 40 years ago. And it describes a new disease called Lyme arthritis because it was um, first observed in Old Lyme, Connecticut, um, and it was due to the actions of a mom, Polly Murray, who was trying to get medical treatment for her son who was very ill. Actually, her whole family was very ill, including her, and one of the symptoms was swollen knees, and so Polly took her son, her, they were referred to a new rheumatologist at Yale University, his name was Alan Steer. Alan Steer had just come from a two-year stint with the CDC learning how to do epidemiology, and so he looked at this kid and they looked at the knees and he said, well, this is probably juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. And Polly said, well, I got news for you. In my neighborhood, all the kids have this. So of course, Alan Steer as an epidemiologist was interested in that and started to look further. And so the, of the cases that he found of this disease, he noted that uh, some proportion of them, right, roughly one in four, actually had this very unusual mark what you see there, that erythematous papule red annular lesion, what that means is a bull's, bullseye appearing rash. 
So one in four of those patients had that particular marker, but he paid a close attention to it because it's what they call in medicine a clinical sign, meaning it was different. And it was different, meaning it showed up in patients, but you can see it didn't show up in other members of the, you know, family members of the people that were involved in that study. So that means it's unique to that particular disease. So then he did some research and he found that in Europe there had been a disease called erythema chronica migrans, which, was, which had the same kind of rash and that was caused by a bacteria. And so he made the connection that maybe the two were uh, related to each other. And in the second paper, which is the same year, you know, he pointed out the arthritis attacks, the swelling in the knee, and then he also pointed out other manifestations, neurologic abnormalities heart abnormalities, immune system abnormalities in those patients. And then basically over the same period of time, um, Wilhelm Bergdorfer was doing research on ticks where he was looking at the bacteria in ticks. He found one that was a spirochete and when he was able to grow that bacteria in pure culture and inject it into rabbits, the rabbits developed a rash just like uh, erythema chronica migrans, and then it turned out that some of Alan Steer's patients also had antibodies against that particular bacteria, and so a bacterial cause was assigned to the disease and actually named after Bergdorfer. That bacteria is today known as Borrelia burgdorferi. So he, at that point, also connected ECM in Europe with Lyme disease in the United States and basically made the two synonymous. So bullseye rash equals Lyme disease, Lyme disease equals bullseye rash. And so in the early 80s, New York State, which um, I have to say, Long Island, New York, uh, people in Long Island were also seeing uh, cases of what they call Montauk knee, meaning swollen knees and other symptoms, and Stony Brook University was looking into this. So the New York State Department of Health thought they ought to look into this too, and so they did this epidemiological study. And so, the way this study worked uh, was to ask New York State physicians, they sent letters to physicians across the state, be on the lookout for this new disease. Here's what the disease is, look for this. So this is something that happens in epidemiology research. It's a much lamented problem when you have a naive audience and you say, be on the lookout for something, what do you think you get? That. So of the reported cases, 400 and some cases came in in 1981 and 1982, 77% of them were reported as having a bullseye rash, 77%. So we go from 25% to 77% as a result of this one study. And what I can tell you is that this one study serves as a basis for this recommendation today that 70 to 80% of erythema migraines rash are associated with Lyme disease. However, that's not what the science shows. There are dozens of studies that show repeatedly, here's two, where one, for example, the first study, the rate of the rash was 33%. In the second one, the rate of a classic rash was actually only 9%. And less than 50% had any kind of rash, but the more common kind of rash is just a rash, a red raised rash around the side of the tick bite. So this, with the science showing that the bullseye rash is not really a very good um, clinical sign of Lyme disease at all. That's what we are left with today. So going back to that study, that epidemiological study, something else they did to entice the physicians to make reports of cases was to offer free serological testing, laboratory testing, and I guess that's a real carrot to physicians, you know, the chance to have some free testing done. So they asked also in addition to the cases for serum samples from those patients, and they tested the serum of, from those patients against the spirochetes that William Wilhelm Bergdorfer had provided, and what they noted at that time was no, no real good association between the serum of the patients and the spirochetes. So notice it's an unreliable predictor of Lyme spirochete infection, it further suggests that the serological assay may not be adequately sensitive to detect a high proportion of cases. And notice that they're reinforcing what the original studies found, which was that only roughly 50% of the patients had antibodies, produced antibodies against this particular bacterium, Borrelia burgdorferi. So that particular study has been reinforced over and over and over again, repeatedly and reproducibly in the scientific literature 
The one you see on the left there, they were showing that the serological tests are 45% accurate. Another study in 2011 reviewed, and you'll notice the comment on that particular study, these findings are sobering, unfortunately do not facilitate diagnosis of Lyme disease. Serologic tests should be in interpreted with great caution. And so what do you do when you have a serological test uh, that, for, that doesn't really help when it comes to the diagnosis of Lyme disease because it is actually not very well associated with the disease? You build an algorithm around it and you recommend it as the only kind of test that should be done for the di laboratory diagnosis of Lyme disease. And so what you see there is the current two-tier testing system recommended by the Centers for Disease Control. Both tiers are serological assays, and I would like to point out that the first tier, which you have to pass to get the second tier test, is wrong half the time. So we have a very insensitive test that is currently being proclaimed as the gold standard test, and in fact, the CDC is currently going so far as to recommend not using any other type of test, at least until the new one comes along. So what do you do when you have a marker, a disease marker sign that isn't really very useful, and you have serologic tests that's wrong half the time, and you are the, you know, the authorities on this disease, the discoverers, if you will, and you keep moving forward, what do you do with the information that your marker and your test are actually very poor? You use them as the clinical endpoint in clinical studies. And by clinical endpoint, I mean for this particular study and many others like it, the bullseye rash is used to make the diagnosis of Lyme disease. And so if a person has the bullseye rash, they are diagnosed with Lyme, and if they don't, they are not. And so this particular study was done in the year, was published in the year 2000. And what I have to say, and Pat Smith and others in this room could probably speak better to this, but the 90s, Lyme disease in the 90s was a, a very difficult place because people were realizing, people in New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, were getting sick with this disease, were being treated for this disease, but were not getting well. And, or were, it was taking a very, very long time. And so then you also had physicians who were seeing those patients who were not getting well, treating them with long-term antibiotics. Long, you know, so one, when one didn't work, they would try another treatment and a, another treatment. And then patients who watched their friends and relatives go through this were becoming quite fright, frightened and were asking for treatment of tick bites, just having a tick bite. So the group that are calling us terrorists basically decided that they had to stop that. And the reason why was because at the same time, antibiotic resistance was a concern, was a growing concern, and they were trying to curtail the use of antibiotics altogether. And I also have to say that at the time of this publication, there was a set of medical guidelines that were about to be published, and they needed evidence to put in their evidence-based guidelines. And so the study came out. So I just want to show you that I wasn't kidding about that. Okay, so they used the EM rash as the clinical endpoint to determine if a patient had Lyme disease or not. So here's the actual study. And this was done in Westchester County, um, New York, where people would go into the physician's office. The ticks were removed, well, was with ticks attached to them, they were removed, they were sent to Fordham University where they were examined by entomologists, those are um, bug specialists, and they were told if they were deer ticks, what kind of tick they were, which isn't really a thing by the way, those are black-legged ticks, um, Ixodes ticks, if they were um, male or female, and what stage, because ticks have three life stages, they have baby ticks, teenager ticks, and adult stage ticks. And all that information was going out at the same time the patients were coming in, and so what the study was, was basically to break the patients coming in into two groups, and one group got oral doxycycline and the other group did not, right? A, a one day treatment um, prophylactic to prevent tick bites, so that basically physicians would stop treating with a full dose of antibiotics. So that's what that study was all about. But I have to say, here's the data that supports a whole lot of conclusions that I don't think are actually supported by the data. 
So if you look here, okay, NIF stage, adult stage, all ticks. So one of the first assertions that they made, note that when it came to the erythema migraines rash, right, see right there, they used the erythema migraines as the endpoint. Notice that only patients who were bitten by NIF stage ticks developed a bullseye rash. And when you looked at the two groups, right, with doxycycline, without doxycycline, it looks like if you gave the patients doxycycline at the time of the tick bite, two pills, then that actually prevented the rash. So from this, in the conclusions of this paper, here's what came out of that. So the risk of Lyme disease is low overall, right, and this extends out to the whole United States. Uh, it's a geographically limited disease because the types of ticks that are doing the biting are only found in a few places in the United States. It's seasonal because the nymph stage ticks, the teenager ticks, are only feeding in May and June in the northeastern United States. So therefore, calm down, people. Just calm down. If you get bitten by a tick, you don't need to take an antibiotic. So I would suggest that what this actually shows is that the risk of getting an EM as the sole sign of Lyme disease is low overall if you live in Westchester County, New York. I think that would be a more accurate interpretation of what the data is. And so then the second thing that came from this is because you'll notice here where we have partially engorged or fully engorged, right, there's partially engorged. Engorgement refers to how much blood the, the tick has sucked at that point. And so as they suck your blood, the longer they're attached, they get bigger, bigger, bigger. So engorgement refers to the fact that the tick has been attached for a long time. And it is well known that the longer the tick is attached, the higher the risk of contracting Lyme disease. So you can see, again, um, the partially engorged nymph stage ticks were the ones that people got rashes from. The flat or unfed ones were zero. And then this is what stopped me in my tracks. Okay, so the adult ticks, zero out of like 200 people developed a bullseye rash. And why that stopped me in my track is because I happened to know my daughter was bitten by an adult female deer tick that was confirmed by the New York State Department of Health. I was told by her physician to just watch it. It was right here. Just watch it. And if she gets a bullseye rash, then bring her back and we'll treat her with antibiotics. So we watched it, and we watched it, and we watched it, and there was no bullseye rash. And then my daughter got Lyme disease and went from being an NCAA All-American athlete to bedridden and out of school, just like Jessica's daughter, just like Pat's daughter, and like so many others that I can't tell you about. So she had no rash, but she got Lyme disease. How do I know that? Because she was CDC positive. Her case was reported to the New York State Department of Health. She was one of those cases that year. So how could that be? And I suggest, and I have yet to interest anybody in doing this particular study, that perhaps there's a difference in the biting or transmission mechanics between the nymph stage ticks, which are very small ticks, and the adult stage ticks, and maybe the adult stage ticks don't cause a bullseye rash. I mean, there, could, there are a number of reasons why the bite from an adult tick would not cause a bullseye rash, because the rash itself is just what happens when the bacteria are present in the skin. So maybe they don't leak out into the skin when you're bitten by an adult tick. But nobody's interested in that, because what disease ecologists tell me is that we don't care about the adult ticks. Why? Because the adult ticks bite humans. So who cares about that? I'm not kidding, because the nymph tick is the thing that keeps the nymph tick and the, and the infected mice are the thing that keeps the bacteria in nature, right, that perpetuates it. But the adult ticks are the, they just bite deer and us, you know, deers are just the same old poor schmucks like us who just happen to be in the wrong place at the wrong time, they get bitten by the adult ticks. Nymph ticks feed in May, adult ticks feed year round. So what this says is that it's a seasonal disease. If, it, if early summer, there's graphs showing this, that this disease happens in the early summer, but it's actually not quite true. And then last but not least, the best conclusion of all is that if you take, if you are given 200 milligrams, two pills of doxycycline within 24 hours of tick bite, it prevents Lyme disease, to which I would say, yeah, no, it actually prevents the rash, which of course is the only approved sign of Lyme disease. So whether or not those patients in the study ever developed Lyme disease, we'll never know, because they watched for a rash for six weeks and then they stopped the study. 
And so what happened with this study was that it became headline. And so in the New York Times, and you'll notice the date. This is a month before the study was actually appeared in the New England Journal of Medicine. Lyme disease is hard to catch and easy to cure. All the study authors were able to weigh in where they said, typical Lyme disease patient has a rash, no other symptoms, takes the antibiotic, is absolutely fine. You can look for it if you develop a rash within a few weeks. This is exactly what my physician told me to do with my daughter. So, and I'm not blaming him because he was going on information that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And if you happen to get the bullseye rash, you can take two weeks of antibiotics and you're actually going to be fine. And this pattern has been repeated over and over and over again, where the conclusion they want to reach is they, they do studies to show their conclusions, which means they've already decided what they want those conclusions to be. And then they, brought, they put out a press release saying, here's what our results of our study are going to be, and that's exactly what the message is going to be. So what I can say is that the, their messaging techniques are very good for all the marketers here in this room. So going on to that antibiotic um, treatment idea. So I mentioned that all of the people that have Lyme disease that I know that are here and elsewhere are here because that didn't work for them. And what I want to say is going back to the very first, once they realized that Lyme disease was a bacterial infection, you go back to this original study, because this was the first clinical trial of antibiotics with Lyme disease. Once they had a bacterial cause, in 1982 and 1983, what did you treat bacterial infections with? Antibiotics, worked every time. And so this study was a study where people with EM were broken into three groups and given one of three different antibiotics, there was no control group with this, and then they were tracked over time. But I want to say this sentence, when I read that in the abstract, I said, what? All three antibiotic groups, nearly half of the patients had remaining symptoms such as headache, musculoskeletal pain, and lethargy. And so I said, well then, isn't that treatment failure? How does this work? And so when I read the article further, what the authors did was very subjectively parse the symptoms that occurred after the treatment into two groups. The major group, which you can see right here, were those that had another rash, were those that were hospitalized due to severe illness because, of, as you can see, myocarditis or, or uh, meningitis, or pain with swelling in a major joint. And so when you look at that data alone, notice, uh, actually, okay, so here's the minor symptoms, right, what, what they pointed out here. Facial palsy, tachycardia, so again, cardiac symptoms, um, headaches, pain in major joints without swelling, and fatigue. Everybody's favorite fatigue, because that's very subjective, right? And so when you parse the data out, patients who had minor symptoms or major symptoms noticed that hardly anybody failed. In fact, the treatment failure rate was 6%. And what they concluded, the conclusion in that abstract is, yep, two weeks of um, antibiotics work and tetracycline is the best. It appears to be the best because notice that um, overall, seven patients ended up being hospitalized for other concerns. So here's the data from the other side. So when you look at that, half of the patients were left with these subjectively determined by the study authors minor symptoms. Minor symptoms like being in a wheelchair, like having, uh, as Pat said, all seizures, right? Uh, of being, so blinding headaches, you can't open your eyes. Those are minor symptoms. And so it's this group that to this moment is the group that nobody really knows exactly what to do about. And so what they do about it is to just say this group doesn't exist. And so also in the same time frame, what they try to do is to prove that treating patients with long-term antibiotics wouldn't work either. So the first of four clinical trials was done in 2001, published in the New England Journal of Medicine by Mark Klempner. Then there were two others. And rather than go through them all, let me just tell you that a biostatistical review of the four clinical trials, meaning how it was done, uh, how the study was designed, how the results were interpreted, was done by this group at Brown University by a biostatistician whose job is to do this. And here's what the conclusion was. So none of those four studies showed anything, is what it comes down to. Because some of them showed improvement in some areas when they were treated with longer-term antibiotics, which I would like to say is six weeks 
of antibiotics, okay? So, and by the way, all, of, all four of those studies were exact, pretty much th the method was exactly the same, just doing the same thing over and over and over again because each study had its criticisms, so they just kept doing it over and over again, all four of them. And some of them showed improvement in some areas, some showed improvement in others, and at the end of the day, basically, those who wrongly conclude that the trials found no benefit from retreatment commit an even greater error because such a statement is demonstrably false. So when you hear there's no evidence that long-term antibiotics are effective, that's where it's coming from, those four trials, but they're not telling you the truth. And so what do you do when you have, when your science is called out in a um, clinical trials journal in this manner? What do you do? You do another one, only you do it in Europe. And then you throw on another couple weeks to make it a little bit longer term. Because why you need to stop these people, these crazy terrorist people who are just saying that the bacteria is still present and we need to do something for them. And so this particular tr trial was published um, not that long ago. And in it, they did the, basically the same thing a little bit different. So there are three study groups and there's a placebo group incorporated in this. But it started with an open label, so they took all, of all the patients and all of them in all, across all three groups received two weeks of IV uh, ceftriaxone, an IV antibiotic. So they all received that. Then they were broken up into groups. That two-week rocephin is supposed to be the shorter-term treatment part of the study, and then it went on for another 12 weeks with oral antibiotics, and there were two different um, oral antibiotic approaches and one placebo group there, okay? So then the data looks, this is what they conclude. And this, by the way, is the headlines that I'm gonna show you in a second. In patients with persistent symptoms attributed to Lyme disease, longer term antibiotic treatment did not have additional beneficial effects on health-related quality of life beyond those of the shorter term treatment. So here's the data. What do you see at the very beginning? And by the way, so they didn't bother to check at two weeks to see what was going on. They just treated everybody the same. And then they parsed them um, after two weeks into these three groups. And it looks like, if you look at the data, if you like looking at data like that, it looks like the two treatment groups and the placebo group basically improved to the same extent. Except that they had all received two weeks of ivyrocephin at the beginning. And so the authors actually noted that. And just sort of said, well, okay, so what that improvement, what, what this whole thing is all about, we don't know. It could be due to the fact that the one conclusion they did make correctly, this is the quality of life of the general population score. And you'll notice that these patients have a very low quality of life. So what they're saying is that the quality of life was so poor that people just started feeling better because you infuse them with antibiotics, or there was some sort of placebo effect, or there was some nonspecific effect, but basically what they said is, we don't know what went on there, but we're not going to worry about it. We're just going to do this, which is to blast out headlines saying, again, because they did this in 2001, long-term antibiotic use doesn't work, studies find, or this one doesn't, aren't helped by long-term antibiotics, or this one, why did these headlines come out? Because there was a press release time to come out with that article that said exactly that. And so what those headlines are, exactly what the press release. So what they wanted you to think is exactly what we were led to think. And so me and people like me, who don't get to publish in the New England Journal of Medicine, not even an editorial, even though we send them, is to rant in op-eds and blogs and elsewhere to say, nope, this is the real deal. So here we go again. It's like, listen guys, the science doesn't add up. There's problems with the science. This isn't correct, this isn't right. So I'm waiting for the New York Times to call. They're just, they just haven't called me yet. I'm still waiting on that. And I added this just a few, a little while ago because as I was on the plane to come here, this article is in press. Please look at the title false and misleading information about Lyme disease. And I know you probably can't read this, but what it says is, we're all concerned about fake news, and so what we're gonna tell you is that, you know, there's this tendency to report fake things about Lyme disease is a growing problem. It's getting bigger again, because they, you know, obviously us terrorists are not being, 
you know, properly subdued. We have them improperly subdued. This is going to be, this is in pre-pub, you can have access to it, you can go read it. And basically it's back to saying that a bunch of anti-science, pseudoscientists, you know, ugly, fat, bitch terrorists are at it again and don't listen to them because they don't know what they're talking about. So that's their facts. I have one last thing to say. This physician, this story is about Todd Murray, who is Polly Murray's son, the son that Alan Steer saw, the son that Alan Steer treated, and was the basis for pretty much all of this. He grew up to be a physician, an ER physician, and notice that he says he still has symptoms. He has minor symptoms, including a permanent heart condition that was diagnosed in 1989. And very soon, you're going to be hearing about somebody else that this happened to as well. And so with that, I'm going to leave it up to you to decide who's telling the fake news here. Thank you.